this is really an honor for me to sit down with, uh, with a good friend who has an amazing story. We do not have enough time to talk about all the things I would like to ask you about. I'll just do a quick introduction for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with Burgess. Your program has a lot of information in it, and you'll see things like the fact that he earned All-American honors at the University of Miami, that he achieved a Super Bowl victory with the Oakland Raiders. It's a very big deal to me. Um, he's created a thriving business. He has a beautiful family with six children, and that he travels the country speaking on the principles that underlie the, the foundations of our American life. But beyond the program and what you might read in a bio, what I hope we can get to today are the things that I see and learn from you. And that is what shaped and informed your views. So if we may, can we start at the beginning and just tell the audience a little bit about how you grew up, what impressed you, what worked, what you aspired to, and how it's influenced your life today? Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I've been looking forward to this. Um, uh, my, my message, basically, when I was at, whenever I talk, is how, um, how great this country's been to every single generation, every single culture and people have come here. It is uh, the one place that as we step up, uh, foot on this, on this land, we know there's hope, opportunity, and freedom. And you can't say that about any other place around the world. Um, and, I, and I say that from a, from a history that many of you guys don't know. I say it from a history of a, of, a, of a community that was very, very successful just by applying the principles that that make this country great. Uh, I'm gonna start off real quickly, just give a little, 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 little bit of an idea of my, my great-great-grandfather, because that kind of sets the tone for what I experienced from this point all the way until uh, I left to go to college, University of Miami. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, Silas Burgess, came here in, this, in a belly of a slave ship uh, with his mother. It was sold in an auction block in Charleston, South Carolina, to the Burgess plant, uh, plant, uh, plantation. Um, end up, at the age of eight, being orphaned his mother either uh, took her own life or had to leave because of the horrendous treatment she was had being had, uh, experiencing on, the, on this plantation. <clears throat> what I think, though, uh, is significant about this era and about who we are is there were men who, though they were enslaved, still dreamed past that obstacle. There were men willing to take, a, take, a, take the risk and attempt to escape, which they did, and went the underground uh, route of the Underground Railroad, Southern Route of the Underground Railroad, which I had no idea, by the way. Have, anybody know about the Southern Route of the Underground Railroad until now? I had no idea. <clears throat> I grew up, by the way, 12 years old. My all-time hero from that point until now is Harriet Tubman because I was so impressed at that at a young age, not only that she escaped, but how many times she went back to help others come to that same route. I had no idea there was a Southern Route. I should have figured it out. I mean, that's what Americans do. That's who we are, North, South, East, or West. <laughs> we believe in freedom. And the Southern Route was facilitated by um, Mexican and, and, uh, and German Americans, Christians, uh, that opened up their doors for, or their barns or their fields for just a hot minute, people passing through they'll never see again, but they, they in their heart, had this feeling that they had to give something back. <clears throat> well, my great-great-grandfather got out to Texas, um, grew up, ended up being a, a very successful entrepreneur owned 102 acres of land, which he paid off in two years. Uh, started the first black church, first black elementary school. Um, Republican, um, strong Christian. His first son's name was Alpha Omega. Says everything, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and a very, very proud American, engaged, proud American. And I can take that all the way throughout the, my generations to my, my dad's generation. You see, I grew up in the Deep South, Tallahassee in the 60s days of KKK, Southern, uh, 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 segregation, Jim Crow laws, but I was so blessed to live in this community that was succeeding in every way you can possibly think of. Just like the, the private communities you guys grew up in, very patriotic, very Christian-based, very family-oriented. Um, they believed in opportunities this country gave, and they believed, number one, most important thing for young men is that we learn to respect women. We learn to love God and respect women. <clears throat> um, that wasn't ab an aberration, by the way, through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I'm giving this a little background because it, 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 it highlights, as we have our conversation, where I see our real fight is today. 40s, 50s, and 60s, it was a black community that led our country in the growth of the middle class. The black community that led our country in the, growth and the commitment of men to marriage, it was 70% in 
is now 30% because of policies. The black community that led our country in terms of percentage of entrepreneurs, 40%, we're now down to 3.8% due to policies. Um, <clears throat> I can go through the litany of success we've had, but it, it, it's important for me to say that because we have, um, we, have a, a, we have probably more divisive country today than ever before. I think it's on purpose. And uh, I think part of it is not understanding our history. And when you see, you can't have pride, you can't, you can't respect and have pity at the same time. We have a country now that we believe, we look at the black, black community, that we can pity them and still respect them. We can't do it. You have to choose one or the other. When you learn our history, you can't help but respect us. But if you listen to the leftists, you can't help but pity us. So you put in policies that are black policies, and we're an American country. There's no such thing as black policy, by the way. It's American policies. It's people policies. And every policy that works for the white American, for German American, for Mexican American, should work for black American. And when, until we start to have the courage to have that kind of conversation, we're gonna to continue to have people talk about white privilege. <clears throat> by the way, it's the most demeaning concept I've ever heard of. I grew up with it, by the way. In the 60s, we had white privilege. Why white people thinking that, that blacks couldn't think, that blacks couldn't do whatever, and we had to prove ourselves, and that's what that my, my parents' generation worked hard to do. I'm gonna just say this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open this up. <clears throat> I, um, I grew up in a community, again, my dad uh, came back from World War II, extremely patriotic, proud of the service he, he and other black Americans served during that time. Uh, I was taught, as young, young as seven years, uh, seventh grade, as I was, had to have the privilege of raising the flag, you never let the flag touch the ground. It'll be desecrated. Um, <clears throat> and he was, uh, he came back, uh, got his PhD at Ohio State, um, very successful entrepreneur, college professor. I would spend my summers in, in his laboratory. Uh, so I was very familiar and very comfortable with biology. And I decided I was gonna go to the University of Miami uh, to get in marine biology. And during that time, Whites didn't think blacks could do those kind of things. You can't, you're not supposed to be able to think that way and achieve that way. That's why, by the way, if you, if you look back on the NFL even, uh, when I got to the NFL in 1973, there were no black centers, quarterbacks, free safeties, and coaches, because it was all thinking positions. And if you think, you can't be a black person. That was the idea. To get back to the white privilege thing, if you ever look at somebody's skin tone and put them in a peg saying, I'm superior because I'm this color or I'm inferior because I'm that color, that's the, 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 ver the verbiage of racist. So I don't care how good hearted people might feel they are, but if you look down on somebody because of their color, you can be as good hearted as you want to, but you're racist. If you choose that, if you make a decision on that person because of his skin tone. And that was a, in my parents' generation, an biggest insult. So to get back to biology, I was told when I, when I left high school that I wasn't gonna do it, I couldn't make it because I was a black guy. And even though I decided my junior year in, high, in college I didn't wanna be a marine biologist anymore, guess what I ended up getting a degree in? Because I, I was gonna prove that guy wrong. <laughs> I don't care if it took me seven, eight, 10 decades, I was gonna prove that guy wrong. <laughs> and I literally lived in a library because I wasn't one of those guys who just got it, you know, some, some of you guys who just you get it. <laughs> Well, I got to, had to work at it 24-7. <laughs> but uh, the goal was very simply to leave there with a degree in what I said I was going to do because this guy said I wasn't. That was the black community during the time I grew up. And that's the community we have to get back to. One that is proud of themselves. Um, if they have a challenge, they step to the plate and say, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to prove that my family, my race, I'm American. I can make it happen in this country. And once we get back to that, uh, a lot of this division goes away. Uh, so anyway, that being said, quick history. That was a very long answer to a short question. I'm sorry about that, Rick. No, we're, we're, <laughs> right. we're here to listen to you. All right. Um, <clears throat> your voice is becoming a unique voice of leadership in the nation. In fact, just this past June, you testified in front of a House Judiciary Subcommittee, and the topic was reparations. What did you say? <clears throat> uh, we have to understand what we're really fighting against. We really do. 
Um, and sometimes we break it down in, into party. Uh, there are really good people in the Democratic Party, and there are really good people in the Republican Party. It's not about party, though. It's about ideology. You see, we are fighting for literally for the heart and soul of our nation. The Geo-Christian values have made us such a great country because every single generation, we seek to find our better selves. Every single generation, we start looking more at what we are inside out, not outside in. That's who we are. It's our nature until we let the other side start to win. The other side are socialists, Marxists, and atheists. Very simply, people who hate God, people who hate our American way, and people who hate the fact that we can be unified in anything we do. The most powerful words in the history of mankind, ever in the history of mankind, to be put together where they were, is we the people. We the people. It says what we can do individually as we decide to, to find solutions, but what we do together is powerful in harmony. And the left doesn't like that. <clears throat> so um, what will they do? Anything they can, guys, to divide us. <clears throat> Anything they can to make black people think that they are hapless, hopeless, and, uh, and, and, and incapable of doing anything. I tell you, my parents' generation would be so disappointed to hear that everything they have done to, su to succeed, all the success, everything they did to overcome has been washed away as if they never existed. Washed away as if from slavery until the white man let us vote in 1960s, we did nothing but sit there and wait for the white man to, let us, to give us freedom. No, we were working hard to get what we call respect because that's what all Americans do. We were, <clears throat> and, and I'm gonna, gonna kinda, you know, we have this conversation about what conservatism really is. <clears throat> um, I, can, I can give it to you in four words. With, with conservatism, because we need, to re, we need to start making this very, very simple. We make it so difficult and complicated, and, and, our, and our kids don't get it. I'm gonna tell you guys something that you can go home today and tell your grandkids, and they'll remember for the rest of their lives. How would that, how would that be if we made conservatism so simple? <clears throat> well, it starts off with understanding one of the greatest Americans in the history of our country. His name was Booker T. Washington. I didn't say greatest black Americans. I said the greatest Americans. Not only did he show what happens when you become educated and you have the desire to win, but what happens when you see past color and you embrace others to develop a team that get things done. Booker D. Washington, uh, born a slave, uh, taught himself how to read, uh, walked miles and miles to get to a college and hoped he could get there, and he, he was a janitor. That's how he, that's how he, he worked his way through college. <clears throat> Started in 1882, a little place called Tuskegee Institute. Black college down in, in, in Tuskegee, Alabama, of all places in Alabama. And the story that's not told is how much support he got from white Americans, former Confederates, who were so impressed with his program and what he was trying to do that they also gave and, and bought from these guys. 1982, by 1905, <clears throat> 1905, Tuskegee was producing more millionaires than Harvard, Yale, and Princeton combined. Now, why is that story not told? Because it shows the blacks were not hapless, hopeless after all, doesn't it? And, and the left cannot stand for that to happen. <clears throat> he also gave, he passed away in 1915, but he gave to the black community a message that resonated. And I realized this later on. Uh, I have my my all-time hero is my dad. Uh, I watched him uh, work hard, take care of our family, provide, show what a man really was all about. But I didn't realize that he was a disciple of Booker T. Washington after I really learned, after he passed away and got more studying than Booker T. Washington. Matter of fact, his whole family was. His brothers were. My community were disciples of Booker T. Washington. Because what Booker T. Washington did very simply, <clears throat> and this is the greatest present I think today he can give our country, is to define for everyone what conservatism really means. It's in four words. Head, heart, hands, and home. Now I'm gonna tell you how you can teach your kids and grandkids this, okay? I want everybody to follow. Head, Head, everybody, everybody, let's do it. Head, heart, hands, home. Head, heart, hands, home. Education, God, compassion, service, industry, free market, home is family. It's just that simple. 
it really is just that simple. And for those uh, that come to this country and deal with it in that way, you wonder why the Asian Indians, why the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Asian, the Asian population and the Eastern Indian Indians, why their communities are still so strong and why they, why, why we have so much respect for them, why they're the very top of the, um, every time you look at what success, what, what success uh, indicators are, you see them at the very top because they believe in education. They believe in their God and they teach their kids that. They believe in industry. They don't, will not sit around and wait for somebody else to do something that they can do. No way. They think it's an insult to have somebody look at them as hapless and hopeless. And they believe in family. <clears throat> we have to get back to that. And uh, I, think that, I think the conversation should be at this, over this coming, uh, this coming year of 2020 is which party believes in it and which party doesn't. Which party was the very first party in the history of mankind, the history of this country, to actually outlaw God? The Democratic Party. Which party took the most uh, uh, competitive race in our nation, the black community, that had men that were truly being men, that would stand up, that would fight for their country, fight for their family, fight for their ladies, and turn them into people that were 70% now desert their family? It was a Democratic Party through welfare. You take away the idea of industry. You take away the idea that you can do it for yourself. You then wait for another man to take care of you. And there's no more despicable way of living a life for a man than to wait for another man to take care of him. Not when he has the ability to take care of himself. Family. <clears throat> the leftists could not get to my dad's generation. My dad's generation, they, whew, I can tell you stories of things that I saw that uh, was very obvious what men did in those days. So they couldn't get to the black men during the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So what they did is they went to soft belly. They went after our women. They put them on a welfare program, in which all you had to do to get a check every week, and I remember, I remember seeing this in the 60s. I couldn't, again, I remember thinking, is there something wrong about this? Then you get a check as long as you don't have a job, uh, don't have a, a husband or a man in the house, um, and have as many babies as you absolutely can have, possibly have. Now, what happens is you have women, all of a sudden, they, their government is their God, and you have these young boys growing up having no idea what man it looks like. That next generation grows up, and now they're calling women baby mamas. That's where we are now. We're now listen, having our kids listen to music that is, that is nothing but poison. Call it rap music. And the guys who become billionaires or become their heroes, they can't speak the English language. They got tattoos all their face and hands. They don't know how to respect women. They will not respect our flag. They know nothing about our country. But they are the heroes of the left. And then you have a guy like me come in and say, you know, guys, let's do it the old-fashioned way. And we're the enemy of the left. So if we really get down to really what it comes down to, head, heart, hands, and home, those communities, as a country, if we apply ourselves to that, we win once again. Because what we do best once we awaken up, and I want to say this, <laughs> what are Americans, and, and, and uh, the, the senator said earlier, you know, we have that tendency, guys. We are the eternal optimists. Think about it, who we are. Our goal is, first of all, we believe in a God that will take care of us even though we go through our times, we just do the right things, it's gonna work out. So we focus on our family, make sure our community is okay. Um, <clears throat> we do all those things and dream about our vacations, we dream about our a town with our grandkids. I mean, we dream, of, we have this vision of all these great things of just do the right thing. And in a sense, we go to sleep. We don't know that we have an enemy we're fighting until we have a Pearl Harbor or 9-11, or what's going on right now. We wake up. And the great thing about Americans, once we wake up, what do we do best? We win. So, okay. Tell me about your latest book, The Title is Why I Stand. 
<clears throat> tell me, um, tell me your deepest hope in writing that book. What were you trying to say and to whom? Okay, That's, thank, thank you. That's a good question, Rick. Uh, the first book, by the way, for those who have not, it, if nothing else, the title is something you will love. <laughs> uh, the title is Liberalism. This is the first book. Liberalism, or well, how do you turn good men into whiners, weenies, and wimps? <laughs> so anyway, I got very popular just because people wanted to hear me say the title. <clears throat> Why I Stand came about because of um, what we've seen in the last three years with the NFL. Um, you see, I, I, look, I look at what's happened the last three years as a wake up for all of us. We need to understand what's going on behind the curtains. You have really good young men, good hearted young men, some of them. They just want to do the right thing. Uh, <clears throat> but they, the way they've been raised in the communities they're raised in, they don't say a prayer. They don't pledge to a flag. They have, no, they have no dad around to teach them how to respect anybody or anything. So they make their income. And what are they told when they look at BET, Black Entertainment Television, which is owned by white liberals, by the way, uh, that this country's terrible, that they cheat are terrible. Hands up, don't shoot, which is a lie. So what they're doing is they are showing their courage to stand against wrong by standing against our flag. The problem, first of all, is it, it did open a door for us to see what's going on behind the curtains. We need to get in there and know that our kids are being attacked. That's where these guys go. These guys, the left are nothing but, but um, cowards and bullies. The left are the ones that used to wear white hoods and now wear black masks. They hide behind bureaucracy, behind jobs where nobody can find who they are. They're cowards and bullies. And what they do is they go after our soft belly. And our soft belly are our kids. They get into education when nobody can hire to get tenure. Uh, I mean, these guys, uh, <clears throat> so anyway. <clears throat> so what we're seeing is not only what's been happening right behind the curtains, but what we now need to know, I, I have to go after it and start to addressing. We're also seeing um, companies like the NFL that are not like the NFL that we grew up with. These guys, the NFL we grew up with, Pete Rozelle, Al Davis, they came through the war, they lived a little bit after the war, they loved our country, made everything around, around the NFL was about America. These guys are globalists. These guys care less. The NFL today has not, could care less about our country. And that's what this book was all about, to recognize that there are things that are doing outside this country is where their real money is going to be made is they build their programs outside, like in China. You wonder why they have a Marxist that is the face of the NFL now. By the way, it's the face of Nike, which is the face of NFL. Where Nike makes their money right now is not here. They make it elsewhere in other countries. So they, we have people in this country that call themselves Americans that can care less about our country. And what they do, and I, I, I use the word, the, uh, the concept of what leftists do in three words. They use, abuse, and discard. What they've done for a long time is they've used the black community for their votes, they abused the black community, keeping them poor, hopeless, so they keep their vote. And now they realize the black community is leaving them. We can talk about that if we have a chance. They need to find another group. That's why the walls, that's not building walls is so important. You gotta understand what these guys are all about. It's not about the, the illegal immigrant. It's not about those kids coming across the border. It's about them keeping their votes, keeping their power. And the reason why they're going nuts right now for the first time, we have a president that's fighting back. They're not being just the old good old guy. You know, we have this, 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 this policy of being presidential is let the left hit you as hard as you can and just say, okay, sorry guys, I'll be better next time. Well, we have a guy who's, who gets on Twitter and drives them nuts. <laughs> drives some of us are nuts also, but I'm okay with that. To be honest with you. I'm enjoying it now at this point. Now that I realize it drives them nuts, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> and let me tell you about power. <clears throat> The left can't live without it. Their goal is not how can we serve and help and provide and, and move forward. Their goal is how much power can I get? And I'll be honest with you, the white supremacist has not been our greatest enemy. It's been the black elitists, those in the black community that call themselves friends of the black race, that vote for every single anti-black 
uh, uh, policy that comes to the pike that keeps us poor, uneducated, hopeless, angry, and they get wealthier at the same time. John Lewis, you name, I mean, the Black Caucus, and it's time we call those guys out. I think, I think I'm, really, I'm really excited about this, is black communities waking up. I think the greatest present of President Obama was that he was such a lousy president. This guy, when, it, when it's all said and done, eight after eight years, black Americans were saying, where's the hope and change? You know, come on, where's the hope and change? So his big promises <clears throat> that left us in a much worse shape. Um, it's interesting, <clears throat> the black community, moral percentage on welfare, um, less income. We had 82% of black teen males across this country unemployed during those eight years. Now think about this, 82% of black teen males. We got into at one point where in the Bomber era, we're up to 14% unemployment. And for those who say they had such a terrible, uh, a terrible, uh, what is the word? When he came in, the economy was so bad. Here, here's a little, 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 little insight. I mean, you guys, some of you guys already know this. <clears throat> that recession was done with within six months after he came in office. We had the slowest recovery since World War II. And we had more misery in the black community than we've ever had before. And the most important thing about what he did when he left is we had a more divisive country. <laughs> guys, the reason why he got a, 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 was voted in was because white Americans said, Finally, we can, we can close this chapter. We can show that race is not the big deal anymore for us, that we really are good-hearted people, that we will go out and serve and help, and our goal is to help everybody. That was the message of that election. He took that and turned it on our turns upside down, and now have more blacks being racist today than ever before, thinking they, thinking they deserve success because they got a black skin. And we have the black elitists that have, have allowed this to happen to us. So um, I don't even know what that question was, but oh, so, 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 the book, so, so, so the book the book came down to very simply, I stand because I stand for a country that gives us all opportunity. And I think it's important that white Americans and black Americans recognize our history has been a good one together. Um, and one last thing about together. <clears throat> My great grandfather had a horrendous experience coming over in that slave ship a horrendous experience on that plantation. But somewhere along his travels from that point to Smithville, Texas, he ran into good people, good white people, Christians, that allowed him to see enough of that faith that he accepted that faith. And that faith is, has, has, has drifted down to me throughout those generations to where I am. A true believer in Jesus Christ, know that everything that happens in our country, um, he wants to bless us as long as we stand strong, continue to stand together, uh, and, and understand who our enemy truly is. By the way, you're always welcome to give better answers than the question. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> All right. Don't hesitate. All right. Um, this is a little wonky, but, but you have a unique perspective on it. So we hear about the transition of the reliable South, which always voted Democrat for years and years and years, <laughs> and we usually hear it in terms of political strategy. What really happened? <clears throat> What really happens, you have to understand, when you take God out of anything, you get a liar. The Democratic Party has been based on lies. The Democratic Party is a party of segregation, KKK, uh, Jim Crow, and the fact that they won't ever own up to it. So what can they best do? They use propaganda to have people think that somewhere, some, through some miraculous deal, in the 60s, they flipped. <laughs> they became the good guys. And this is the story that, that we hear out there. This is another, uh, what these guys love to do is steal. They, they steal, whether they steal our money, whether they steal our, our past, our history, our future, that's what they do. Uh, <clears throat> so what they had done, they stole our history. Just like right now, you guys have know so little about uh, my, my, my history, my black history. The reason why I'm so proud of who I am and proud of being an American, I was taught my history back when I was a kid, and I built on top of that. And part of my history is what we have done together. That, uh, so, <clears throat> um, hmm, 
I have to remember where, where I was going with this. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so what, what it is is these guys, since they, they'll never own up to what they've done wrong. Matter of fact, I, I, can, I, can, I can kind of summarize who these people are. When I say the people, it's an ideology. Keep in mind, they're good people in the Democratic Party. I used to be a Democrat. Uh, so I know that it's just education that our hearts will eventually. There are some bad people in the Democratic Party too, by the way. Some who just love and just hate hate us doing this thing together. So, <clears throat> so um, in the process of realizing what they, what they steal, what they like to take, uh, again, they, they take out history. Um, oh my goodness, guys. Oof. I just lost it again, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, it'll come to me in a second, I promise it will. And meanwhile, maybe, maybe a good idea, because I, I, love, I love answering questions. And if you guys have any questions for me, I'll make them sure a lot, lot shorter. So let's we'll do this. Sure we're going to have, Candace, are we going to do cards or hand raises? So we're on, just so everyone understands, we're on Facebook Live and we can't hear the questions from the audience is the only reason. I was just going to help remember maybe. Okay, yes, yes. What I wrote down is that when you take God out of anybody, you get a liar. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> remember those four things? You take God out of anything, you get, I'm going I'm I'm to actually summarize the Democratic Party in one word. Anybody that's ever dealt with this, you know what I'm talking about. Anybody know what the word narcissist is? Okay. Heartless, guiltless, totally self-centered, and will do anything without any thank you or sorry. And that's who this, that's, that's who this ideology is. That's who this, what the ideology, this ideology is. So, so what they will do is instead of trying to correct themselves, trying to make amends, they just change the narrative to make sure the other guy is now the bad guy. So the, the, guy, the, 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 the organization <clears throat> that, um, that started KKK, by the way, the KKK was eliminated in the late 1980s. The Republican Party came down and, and arrested about a thousands of these guys and it was done with. You know who brought it back? President Woodrow Wilson in 1915. He brought back this film called Rise of a Nation. And that film started this whole thing, KKK thing again. And then 10 years later, about 20,000 of these guys were marching down the streets of Washington, D.C., proud of who they were. So, so what they do is, again, they want to switch it around. And just, just know, if you, if you understand our history, those who were white supremacist Democrats in the Deep South in the 60s, as they lived as white supremacists, they died Democratic white supremacists. They didn't switch over and become a Republican because Republicans stood against everything they stood for. Uh, another thing about the KKK, uh, KKK ended up hanging about, lynching about uh, 4,700 Americans during their reign. 1,300 of them were white Republicans. Uh, <clears throat> and you wonder, the Democrats have aborted over 20 million black babies with the help of the black elitists. So who's done more damage to the black community? KKK or these black elitists who stand as matadors and let these guys in our communities to wreak havoc so they can keep their wealth? All right. I'm going to ask you one last thing, then we'll go to questions. Okay. But I, I want to give you a chance to talk about this. It's always telling to me to watch. You've had this great professional. You had this strong upbringing, a great education, a high profile pro professional career. And it's interesting to me what you're doing now. Tell me about your youth organization. <laughs> I, uh, again, based on that background I guess gave you, the background I grew up in, when I left the game in 1983, uh, my dad and I for 20 plus years, uh, he was a college professor, ended up uh, purchasing this five, uh, 400 acre uh, farm at uh, Five Spring Fed Lakes and he put this fishery together. And we'll talk about how we can bring kids out to this farm give them experience of educating uh, through the environment, uh, having them work during the summer so they can earn some money, so they can do some things. We, uh, this model we were putting together. And we talked about it. Uh, when I left the game, I, I knew that the environment that I grew up in was not the same in 1983. I realized we were heading in the wrong direction. So I, somewhere I figured I'm going to be able to impact my community by just figuring out a way to get it done. My dad passed away, and I uh, got older. I raised my family and just didn't, didn't, didn't pull it together. And when I came out here, I realized, you know, it's time for me to do something with this. Because this, we talked about it for too many decades. And so I uh, <clears throat> started a, a, a not-for-profit. It's called Second Chance for Youth. 
Second chance four, the number four. What does the four mean? Yeah. All right, second chance for you, all right? Remember to tell your kids and grandkids to get home, all right? You gotta take that one back with you. <clears throat> and uh, I'll go over it simply, is to take this generation of kids that have been tossed away. Many of them have never been given an, an opportunity, the first opportunity. Many of them have, don't have fathers in their home. You go across this country, 70% of them don't have fathers in their home. And there's a recidivism rate when you get into the juvenile system, about 70% of them come, come back. Because they, they, they're not really, there's no correction, this, this is punitive. When they get out, they go back to the same community, no education, now owing the government because of, rest, uh, because of restitution costs, and no one, no one given them an idea that you can dream outside this obstacle. So um, over the last couple of years, I've been uh, working this program, and I tell you, this, this valley, uh, I can't say enough about you guys. Uh, coming from the East Coast, from Philadelphia area, what I can say about the valley that you might not be aware of, this is a place, and I, I, I tie it down to three things, place of service, solutions, and surplus. Solutions, we have entrepreneurs here that are always thinking outside the box. How can I make it a better, how can I make more profit by being a better, bringing a better service? <clears throat> Love serving, that's in our nature, it's innate with who we are. And for those of us who finally get a little extra, we love to give back. So you put that together with youth, it's the greatest place to actually do what I'm doing now. So my goal very simply, <clears throat> I'm gonna highlight it in a way that I, I, I best can do it. I look at it as the uh, 2000 Stripping Warriors. Once they get it, they get it. And these young people will be the ones that will bring my community back because they'll be the ones that are advocating for, for a second chance. They'll be saying, I can do it, you can do it. They'll be the ones going back and rolling their sleeves and helping their kids, the young kids, to help themselves out. And it'll be also the voices against the leftists. We need to have voices within the community against these leftists, because right now there's not enough. And I believe once they come out, we get our race back. And once we get our race back, because the left has been so addicted to us, you know they need 95% of us to move forward. You know that? They need 95% of our vote <clears throat> to, to get their power. What happens if that goes down to 85, 70, 65%? They need to tear down those walls even faster, don't they? Because uh, they're lost. And that's why they're so frantic. That's why these guys are panicking. The black community is leaving the plantation, guys. We're leaving. And, I'm, and I tell you, on social media, it's so neat to see how many blacks are saying, I voted for Obama. What in the world was I thinking about? We're waking up, and now that we're talking to each other, we recognize it's just not one or two conservatives out there, knucklehead guys. There are many people, just normal folks, trying to make a living, trying to raise their kids, trying to have a bigger dream like every one of us, but the, dream, the American dream has been outside of their purview because they've been, they've been in this environment. So we're, we're winning that fight, and I'm excited about it for sure. Okay. okay. Let's do questions for okay. a little less than 15 minutes. So what is your advice? How can you be conservative and bold without being mean and angry? Very good. It's a good question. And I'll say this. Remember that I go back to we the people again? We have, and I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm going to use even better analogy. I just came back from Houston uh, where I spent some time with some of my, my buddies with the Raiders. Uh, you know, some we just lost uh, one of my really good friends, uh, Cliff Branch, just recently. Uh, uh, and there's one thing about the Raiders of old. And I have to remind people, younger people, uh, yes, the Raiders did win football games. They really did in the old days. You know, before your time. Before your time, we used to win games. <laughs> okay. Um, but what the Raiders represented was a group of guys who in those days had no other place, no, 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 no other place to go. You have to remember what the Raiders used to stand, stand for. They were a motley crew. These are guys that were too rambunctious, too rebellious, too old, too much in trouble for other teams, but they're just right for the Raiders. Because Al Davis' motto was just win, baby. His old idea was very simply, if you want a second chance, come here. We'll give you a second chance. Now you won't get a third. <laughs> you leave here, you won't be going to place else. <laughs> but but, uh, <clears throat> but it was a team that we were so different in so many ways, but it came down getting on the field, we did what it took to play our part to win the game. And that's what we have to do as, as, Republic, as conservatives. And I'll say this, my, 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 uh, <clears throat> my uh, loyalty is not to the Republican Party, it's to conservatism. 
If the Republican Party ever became Democrats, I would never be a Republican again, either. So it's the conservative values we're talking about. <clears throat> and we have our different roles, just like on that team. We had, a, we had Todd Christensen. Believe it or not, Todd, before he became all pro tight end, he was the captain of the, the, uh, the special team. When, when, if you look back in, on Super Bowl 15, you see Todd Christian walking out on the field, on the field as a captain of the special team. Because we did whatever we had to do to make the team and to, to play our part. We have to do the same thing here. Everybody can't, everybody can't speak the way I do. I speak the way I do because I grew up in the era I did, with the dad I did, with the experiences I had, with the fear I had to get through. I mean, I, I, so to me, this is my moment to speak the way I do. Some of you guys might be able to do it best behind the scenes just by supporting someone, uh, by uh, encouraging someone, by getting in there and just and, and, and on a one-on-one -on -one basis helping these kids wherever you can. So here, the key to it is we, we take what we have, our, our expertise, our drive, and add that to the pie and support those who might not agree totally 100%, but support those who in, are in the same ballpark that we're in. At the end of the day, what we do know is this. <clears throat> we need Republican seats in the Senate, in the House, and we need a Republican president. If you want to throw away the, the future of, my, of the black youth in our country, of our, of our Hispanic youth in our country, let's put another Democrat in office. And they'll continue to do what, they do, what they've been doing in the past. One, one last point. I want you guys to understand what, I'm, what I mean by that. <clears throat> How many of you guys knew that in the state of California, state of California, this is 2017, 75% of the black boys in the state of California cannot pass standard reading and writing tests? How about that? Now, you know, we're talking about space pro. You know, and here, here's, here's what gets me. <clears throat> I say that in some cases, it's not even a gasp. It's like, uh, what else is new? That's called the soft bigotry of low expectations that many of us now are buying into. We've heard this so long. That, is, that we kind of accept the fact that black kids can't think, black kids can't study, black kids can't, can't keep within the law, black kids can't, can't be uh, solid parents. We're accepting that because we've seen it so long and nobody's solving it, and we're just going with it. So <clears throat> the fact is, those kids have no future unless we get in there and give them hope and give them opportunities so they can work themselves up, give them confidence in themselves, they can do the things with themselves that in the past they have not done. Uh, and, and to do that, uh, we just all need to do our own part in our own way, okay? Okay, I admittedly shuffled the deck because yeah. I want to hear your answer to this. <clears throat> what do you think of the protest of the Betsy Ross flag on the Nike shoe? <clears throat> Nike is a global, they're globalists. Nike and, and, and um, NFL, Leadership, I won't say all of them because I, you know, one thing about Marxists and socialists, they're he heavy fisted. You see what happened uh, with the, the, the owner of uh, the Dallas Cowboys, Cowboys when he, he tried to stand up. They charged that guy with millions of dollars because he stood up. Now, they let Kovnik, the Marxist, continue to, to kneel, but they charged the owner millions of dollars because, and there's nothing they can do about it. There's no place they can go and, and get redress. So they, they make the message and keep the message, you keep quiet or we're coming after you. I remember the guy, the pizza, uh, the pizza guy. <clears throat> um, what was it? Papa John's. You know, he, he made the mistake of standing up against the NFL, and guess what? He's no longer Papa John's. He's, he's, he, they destroyed that guy, because <clears throat> that's what they do. So... Um, now, when it comes down to, um, what was the name? Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross. Mm -hmm. They're going to take every opportunity they can to demean our country. That decision by Nike was not done two weeks before. That decision was done in the boardroom months and months before. Where can we get the biggest impact on making sure that our brand is not as American as it used to be? That our brand can be more global? That people in China loves us even more to buy our products? what, four billion in China, 100, 300 million here in the United States, their, their profit is elsewhere. And I know and this is kind of a, a, a lot to skim past you guys <laughs> at one time. Pick up my book and it makes more sense. These guys are not our friends. Behind the doors, behind in the boardrooms, they are working against the American way. 
because they love their profit more. And it's sad to see Americans that, that will trade, that will, be, that will do that to other Americans. But when people take God out of it, and they care more about themselves and, their, and their, their, their profits and their prestige, that's what we get. We get a Baltimore. Thank goodness President Trump called that guy out, John, John uh, Cummings, another black elitist who has sold his, 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 his folks out for decades, or has become very, very wealthy, and the people in his community become very, very poor and hopeless and vote Democrat. See, all, all that's changing though, okay? How, uh, so Senator Romney mentioned this, and you mentioned it in a couple of ways, and it's on your list of four. How do you win the argument for hard work, for industry, when everything we're hearing from candidates has to do with free stuff? Okay. <clears throat> Tell you how we win it, guys. It's really simple to me. We have to have the courage to not only point to God, but act like he exists. We can't go around and, 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 uh, and allow them to tell us we can't speak of God in public places because they say so. We just can't do it, guys. Uh, we have a country that's been choice, been blessed, because we have a God in heaven that's given us this opportunity today to be the freest country in the history of mankind. So it begins with that. <clears throat> the second thing is we need to let these guys who decide they don't want to take care of their families, know that they're nothing but, they're, they're, they're lower than amoebas. That was my old biology, goes back, amoeba. <laughs> Came back for some reason. <laughs> anyway, um, we can't allow um, our young boys to think that, uh, that they're gonna be respected as men if they don't act like men. And the first thing they need to do is recognize they have a role. And the role is not to out women women. The role of men is not to out women women. Does that make sense? Yeah. And women is not your role to out, out man men. We're, we're getting this confused. And once we get to the point where men are not willing to say, I am a man, which means I'm here to protect, provide, and lead my family and give my life if I have to. If I'm not willing to do that, then call me something else. Don't call me a man, please. All right? And until we get that message back to our kids, and that only happens when we point to God first. But once we point to God first, then men know what, know what they're supposed to do. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you guys, <clears throat> you guys understand this. The most powerful force in your life is womanhood. Because a man would do anything to protect womanhood, provide for womanhood, anything. To be respected by womanhood. And uh, that's the power of womanhood, boy. Uh, just, just be a feminine woman, and you, you gotta tell you, you got these guys around, you can literally get them, you know, you got them. <laughs> you got them. <laughs> you don't need to go out there and, 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 and duke it out with them. <laughs> you know, get a, you know, get, a, get all the stuff you see in movies now, how they turn these, uh, these women into, into really tough men. <laughs> don't need to do that. Let, let's do our part, guys. In the process of doing our part, we get our country back. Men, be strong, caring partners, um, in which there's nothing you won't do, including change, including being humble for your family and for your wife. If you do that, there's nothing that wife won't do for you. And that's how we win, because those kids see that. And they see, you know, my mom and dad are not perfect, but they're pretty good. <laughs> to that point, I always laugh, because my dad, uh, my all-time hero, Big time. I mean, there was never ever anybody close. But his last few years, I had to remind him, my last spanking was a mistake. I didn't deserve it. So even my dad was, could make mistakes. <laughs> he gave me a spanking that I didn't deserve. He thought I was trying to disrespect mom, and I really wasn't. <laughs> so, so anyway, anyway, little side note. Uh, we laughed about that one anyway. Go ahead. Okay. So we're, we're at a time I'm going to wrap up. There is one last question that I'm... Uh, intentionally ignoring whoever asked about a run for office. I'll let you ask it personally so that we can keep this an apolitical event. <laughs> but there you go, if you'd like to answer that later. Which, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So just in closing, I wanna thank all of you for being here today and participating in this important event. The next event in our series is this Friday, August 23rd. We'll feature Representative John Curtis and an expert panel speaking on religious liberty. 
Um, if you're not aware, don't forget that the Sutherland Annual Gala is now posted to the website for Saturday, November 9th at the Grand America, and that happens to be Veterans Day weekend. And it's notable that one of our honorees is a very respected former senator and brigadier general uh, and a local favorite son, Jake Garn, will also be recognizing noted historian and author Doris Kearns Goodwin and uh, the founding family of the Sutherland Institute. So if you're interested in being part of that, please go onto our website at sutherlandinstitute.org. And again, thanks to all of you for being here today. Can I, can I say one last, one last word? Yes, you can. Uh, I'm, I'm an I'm an, I'm a uh, eternal optimist, and I'm I'm so blessed to be an eternal optimist. But I can say this, and I want you guys to remember this: as we go through this process of life, we go through our fight for our country. Just remember this: in the end, we win. We know that last page, don't we? <laughs> All right. So keep that in mind. <laughs> keep your chin up. Keep your sunny side up, guys, because in the end, we win. All right. So okay. All right. Good. <laughs>